Hey there. In this video, we're going to simulate some different versions of an infectious disease to try to get a handle on the basics. We'll explore three phases. The epidemic phase, when the disease is new, the endemic phase, when the disease has been around for a while, and the eradication phase, when we finally get rid of the disease for good. This city has two kinds of locations, homes and non-homes. Three blobs live in each home, and each day each blob will go to up to three different places near where it lives, and then return home at the end of the day. The disease will have three different states. Blobs start out blue in the susceptible state. If a blob catches the disease, it becomes infectious, and can then infect other blobs that are in the same room. Blobs stay infectious for two days, and then they enter this recovered state, turning gray. And in this model, recovered blobs are permanently immune. This is called an SIR model. This is obviously a lot simpler than real life, so we're not going to try to make any specific predictions about COVID-19, but the goal here is to get a feel for the overall patterns of disease spread, so this should do the trick. All right, let's run our first full simulation. We'll start with 10 infected blobs and an infection chance of 1% each time blobs interact in the same room. Let's pause here. This graph stacks numbers from the three different states on top of each other. For example, at the end of the third day, out of the 1,000 blobs, 798 of them are susceptible, 172 are infectious, and the other 30 have already recovered. This R0 number that I mysteriously put up here is called the basic reproduction number. It's the number of new infections caused by each infectious blob before it recovers, on average, assuming there's no immunity. For example, if R0 equals three, and we start with two infectious blobs, each would infect three more blobs on average and stop being infectious itself. So the new number of infectious blobs would multiply by three, getting to six total. And this multiplication repeats, leading to exponential growth. At least that's what we would expect. The real world is chaos though, so it doesn't work out so cleanly. That's one reason I like running simulations. They force us to look at the messiness. Here, R0 was calculated by averaging over many possible versions of the simulation, all with the same settings. The result is 2.5, so if everything were clean and tidy, we'd see the number of infections multiply by 2.5 over the two-day infectious period. But at least for this run, the growth was quite a bit faster. This is part of why we don't precisely know R0 for COVID-19. In the real world, we don't get to run the simulation a bunch of times to average things out. Anyway, let's see what happens as we keep going. As more and more blobs become infected, the growth slows down. R0 pretends that all the blobs are susceptible, but that quickly becomes untrue. So we should really add this factor S here for the fraction of blobs that actually are susceptible. R0 times S is given its own symbol, usually R, but sometimes RT. It's like R0, but for some later time when immunity is slowing things down. Instead of the basic reproduction number, R is just called the regular reproduction number. And as long as I'm throwing some terms at you, S goes down over time, so instead of exponential growth, this becomes logistic growth, which flattens out after a while. We won't dwell on logistic growth here, but I'll link to some videos in case you're interested in going more deeply into the math. When R is above one, the epidemic is still growing. When it's equal to one, the number of active cases stops growing. And when it's less than one, the cases decline. And when this fraction of susceptibles is small enough for R to go to one, it's called herd immunity, which we'll talk more about later. But one thing we should note now, herd immunity means the number of cases will start dropping, but it's not an absolute cap. The total number of cases can go much higher if a lot of cases are happening at the same time. In this case, at the peak of active cases, 41% were infectious at the same time, and when all was said and done, 85% were infected at one point or another. So that's the basic shape of an epidemic, but let's run through a few more simulations with different infection rates to get a better sense of what different situations might look like. I picked infection rates that would lead to R0 values of 1.5, 1.1, and 0.9. Looking at R0 equals 2.5 again, the results are pretty close to what we saw last time. When R0 equals 1.5, as we'd expect, we'd see a smaller peak and fewer cases overall, but it's still a pretty large portion of the population. When R0 is 1.1, there's still an exponential light growth at the beginning, but it's just a 10% increase every two days, so we don't see a big spike this time. And when R0 equals 0.9, it's 
less than one, so we expect the disease to decline even before any immunity builds up. And it's good to see that that is indeed what happens. Right now, you might be thinking, as I was, okay, I get that r naught determines whether it'll grow, but how do things like the length of the infectious period or the size of the population affect how the growth plays out? To help answer this, I made some more variations on that first sim. The first one has the same settings as before with a two-day infectious period and 1,000 blobs. The second has an infectious period of one day instead of two. The third one has an infectious period of 10 days. And the last one has 10,000 instead of 1,000 blobs. And in each case, I adjusted the infection chance to keep r naught close to 2.5. Before we hit go, try making some predictions about the peak number of infections, the total number of infections, and anything else you think might or might not vary. Not too surprisingly, the timelines are different. The one day infection peaked and burned out quickly. The 10 day infection took longer. And in the city with 10,000 blobs, it also took longer for the disease to spread from 10 initial blobs to a significant portion of that larger population. But the peak and total infection percentages turned out to be almost the same in each case. The only thing slowing the spread in these simulations is herd immunity. So the fraction infected stays pretty steady in different situations with the same r not. I chose 2.5 as the example r not because that's in the range of early estimates of r not for COVID-19. There's some uncertainty there and it'll be different in different places, but according to our current understanding of the disease, if we did nothing at all, it would be reasonable to expect something like this. So that's what's worrying about it. All right, that's the epidemic phase. On to the endemic phase. In our model so far, the disease ends up dying off all by itself. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen in real life though. There are two reasons for this. First, immunity is often not perfect or permanent. And second, long-term immunity isn't inherited. So there's always a constant stream of new susceptible people. To put this into our model, we'll give the blobs an average lifespan of three weeks. At the beginning of a simulation, the ages will be all spread out. And then when an older blob dies, it'll be replaced by a new susceptible blob. So with that in place, let's run some more sims. This time we'll track r naught and r in real time. r naught is still gonna be calculated from an average of many sims, but r is gonna be based on counting the new infections on this one run of the simulation. So it'll bounce around a bit based on random happenings, especially when the numbers are small, but it will let us see the growth in real time. Anyway, here we go. Now we can see a little bit more clearly why infectious diseases don't go away on their own. At first, there's this initial epidemic with R greater than one, just like before. And then again, we get to a point where R is less than one, leading to a decline. But this time the infection count doesn't decline all the way to zero. Once it gets low, the number of susceptible blobs starts increasing again, and in turn, R climbs back above one, and then the number of infections starts to rise again. There's an equilibrium here, with R always getting pulled back toward one. And as we saw before, on average, we expect R to be one at the herd immunity level. We can calculate the herd immunity level for any value of R0. As we said before, R0 times S equals R, and herd immunity is where R equals one. So the fraction of susceptibles for herd immunity is one over R0. And herd immunity is usually given in terms of the fraction of people no longer susceptible, so it ends up being one minus one over R0. When R0 equals 2.5, we get 60%. If you've heard estimates of 50 to 70% for herd immunity for COVID-19, this is where that range comes from. Before we move on to the eradication phase, I wanna say again that the goal here is to get a sense for the broad patterns at play. The size and the timings of these cycles and the average number of people infected will depend a lot on the properties of the real disease and how we react to it. And there are some other factors like seasonality or mutations that can complicate this picture. But even with these real world complications in place, an endemic disease always fluctuates around this herd immunity equilibrium. All right, on to eradication. 
10 days into these simulations, the Blob City will discover a vaccine. After that point, when a blob dies and a new blob appears, that blob will have a chance of getting vaccinated, turning green. They'll act just like the gray recovered blobs, but they're green instead so we can keep track of them. We'll again use this disease with R0 equals 2.5. Here, herd immunity is when 40% are susceptible or when 60% are not susceptible. So I would expect a 60% vaccination rate to get rid of the disease, but we should check that. And let's also look at 50%, 35%, and 20%. Again, before we hit go, try to make some predictions. Will 60% actually result in eradication? And what'll happen with the lower rates? All right, so 60% did indeed do the job, but none of the others did. Before running these, I'll admit that I thought that 50% might do it since some blobs would be immune from actually having the disease, but it turns out that as long as there's room between this vaccination floor and the herd immunity threshold, the disease still has room to wobble around in equilibrium. True eradication turns out to be really hard. We'd have to do this for all populations that can carry the disease. This is hard enough for humans, but for many diseases, it includes animals too. So that's just infeasible. But eradication isn't the only goal. More vaccination still means smaller spikes in infections and fewer sick blobs overall. It's encouraging to think about being able to manage, if not eradicate a disease, but right now we're still very much in the epidemic phase. If you find yourself doing okay right now and want to find some way to help, but just aren't sure what to do, one thing you can do is hit that button below the video to donate any amount to Give Directly. Give Directly puts your donations directly in the hands of other humans in need. It's a top rated charity for making donation dollars do the most good, it's tax deductible, and the button is right there. Whether you're in a place to give or not, I do appreciate you watching to the end. Thanks.